Folks, we are live back here, Tech Ed Europe, Barcelona. Um, pretty excited talking about C Sharp and Roslyn. Uh, Kevin, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Kevin Pilchbasan. I'm a uh, engineering manager at Microsoft on the languages team. Uh, I've worked on uh, the languages team for the last 12 years, doing stuff like IntelliSense, refactoring. And for the last four or five years, I've been working on the Roslyn project, where we've been rebuilding the C Sharp and VB compilers. Yeah, so uh, if you have questions on C Sharp, this is your time not just to answer, because you're doing a number of things, like best practices at the conference, right? Like a async await talk? Yeah, uh, so this morning I did a future of C Sharp and VB talk. Uh, tomorrow afternoon I have a talk about async best practices. And Friday I have one about uh, when would a C Sharp developer be interested in, in checking out C++. Uh, that one's, that one's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and for folks who aren't familiar, maybe maybe they they were unaware of what Roslyn is. Maybe set set why Roslyn, and, and what are the benefits that a customer gets out of it? Sure. So uh, what is Roslyn? Like I, I mentioned earlier, Roslyn is uh, re-implementation of the C Sharp and VB compilers. But the real point of that is to uh, to open up the compilers and provide uh, a rich object model and API about all the information the compiler knows about your program, letting other people take advantage of that. And so the target audience really falls into to three categories. Uh, we talk about the, the millions, the thousands, and the tens. OK. So the millions are every developer. So what do they get out of Roslyn? Well, they get a richer IDE experience that has some new features, some new refactorings. Uh, and they get a new language that has new language features that make them more productive. The thousands are really partners, uh, Visual Studio partners and external community partners who can take this language understanding and this object model and build smart tooling around it. So imagine uh, better extensions for Visual Studio that can really add more refactorings or add custom diagnostics or, or any of that kind of thing. And then the tens is us. It's our team. Uh, we had a, some existing code bases for the C Sharp and VB compiler that were each around 15 years old. Uh, <laughs> they grew up out of completely different heritages. And so they, were, they didn't really share any code in common. And, uh, and they were kind of hard to work in. And so we really set ourselves up to have a, a great architecture that allows us to innovate faster uh, in the language space and in the tooling space, the IDE space, so all three of those. So uh, you know, you mentioned in the, I guess it was the millions was the first one. Yep. Um, what are some cool things like, hey, I'm just editing C Sharp. The editor will now have X to make my life uh, better. Sure. So, uh, so first of all, for Visual Basic users, we've added refactoring support. So in VS 2005, Yay. we had rename refactoring. Uh, and we had a few other ones in C Sharp. So we now actually have the same set of refactorings between C Sharp and VB. On the C Sharp side, we took the same refactorings that we had. And we've already added two or three more. And we'll probably continue to add more to that set. We've made it a lot easier for ourselves to add more refactorings over time. So that's one example. Uh, second example would be kind of live diagnostics about your code. Uh, not just diagnostics that you might think of in the past, but uh, think about using statements. We've had for a while now a feature where you can right click in a file and say, remove the usings that I don't use in this file. Right. But I have to remember to invoke that command and, and I don't know what's going on. And so what we've done as a kind of a simple example is we now detect what usings we don't, you don't use and we subtly kind of make them be partially transparent. And so they fade out of the editor. And if you put your cursor near them, then you get a little light bulb saying, hey, you could remove these usings. Do you want to do that? Mm, OK. So, uh, um, Back uh, in that one in particular, is it actually removing it? It's only when a, a customer actually puts his cursor in. It's not like a, um, maybe a code analysis step that, hey, you finish your builds. Before you check into GitHub, Like do this like code scrub, if you will. Sure. Uh, so the idea with these diagnostics is that you can kind of control the level of verbosity that they are, using the okay. same rule sets that you already use today for FXCOP, uh, the code analysis stuff. So you could say, uh, right now we have it marked as kind of a, an informational level diagnostic that says, hey, by the way, you have this using that you didn't use. 
Uh, but you can promote that, and you can say, you know, make it a warning. Or, you know, if you really want to punish your team, you can say, <laughs> make it an error. You can't actually build anymore if you have this using that you didn't use. Yeah, no, that would be that'd be a great way to annoy the team. That's that right. Would be <laughs> fantastic. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, and uh, Glenn Block talked about Script CS and some of the stuff that he was doing, it, and I was unaware of Script CS. And have you looked at that at all? Or? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So can you talk about some of the things, like from an extension perspective, the capability? Abilities that it gives you because when I think of like uh, lightweight and C sharp and especially as somebody who has console application 151 or whatever, right? Like uh, <laughs> probably really guilty of that. But if you could spend some time talking about that and then uh, from a community perspective, why yep. that's cool. Uh, so scripting is something that we kind of released in some of the early previews and. Uh, and we've kind of taken a break from it, and, and Glenn's probably mentioned that. Uh, <laughs> we've been trying to focus on shipping and, and getting the Roslyn compilers and the IDEs done. Uh, but I think scripting is a really interesting thing that we're looking at, which is kind of this idea that uh, simple programs should be simple, right? And so why is it that just to you know, see how to use console.writeline, I have to create a project, and I have a project file, and an app config file, and I have a namespace, and I have a class, and I have a main method. Like, why can't I, like in most programming languages, just say, write line, hello world? Right. right. Um, and so we're kind of trying to bring that experience. Uh, why do I have to have a separate compile step that, uh, that produces a different thing that I have to run? Why can't I just run my source code directly? And so we've been looking at creating, and, and the Script CS guys have taken that and gone a little bit further. The idea of having CSX files that have C sharp code in them, but kind of a lighter weight syntax for C sharp code, where I can have statements at the top level, or I can have methods at the top level. So I don't have to have all the ceremony of classes and, and all that stuff. I can choose to if I want to, but I don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the interesting piece that the Script CS guys have done on top of that is taking the convention based patterns that they see in, in some other development worlds and bringing that forward so, uh, so I can just have a CSX file in a directory that has a NuGet packages.config. And script CS knows how to go find those NuGet packages, download them, pass them to the Roslyn compiler as references, figure out which binary in the NuGet package, and all that stuff. So I can just say, oh, you know, I want to use NancyFX, mm -hmm. for example. Let me have a simple script that uses NancyFX. Or, uh, and for folks who don't know what Nancy FX is? It's a, a lightweight uh, web server hosting framework. So you can very okay. simply create a, a listener that listens for web requests, for okay. example. Very cool. Um, but that's one example, right? Any, any NuGet package that you want to look at, you can very trivially get started using Script CS by just uh, dropping a packages.config in the same directory, and Script CS will know how to reference it and, and give it to you. So you mentioned, you know, uh, maybe. I, I'm trying to think of the words you use. Maybe deprioritize or, or prioritize more. Shipping, shipping is winning. Yeah, yeah. No one's going to argue that. But is, is uh, are those scenarios that you're looking for say, sort of post, or is it like, hey, this was kind of a way to get feedback, and it looks like we're not seeing interest in, in sort of the scripting world for C sharp? Uh, no, we're definitely seeing interest in it. Um, it's probably not something that will happen with the the first launch of the VS14 stuff. But as as people keep reminding. Uh, us gently, uh, I'm sure. Uh, gently, um, you know. Now that we're shipping regular updates to Visual Studio, we have opportunities to deliver these things kind of on an ongoing basis. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so we're definitely looking at getting back into scripting and, and delivering something for scripting as soon as we can. Okay. And some of the stuff that was in the older ones was there like a uh, REPL, the read, execute, print loop. Yep. Uh, the so we built a. Uh, a REPL window, that's for people who don't know, that's a, a read, read, evaluate, or execute, or evaluate, yeah, whatever loop. it is, yeah. Um, we call it the interactive window. And so it's kind of a tool window in the bottom of Visual Studio that I can type some code in, and it's this scripting code. So I can just type a call to a method, and we'll evaluate that and run it right away. Uh, it was pretty, pretty exciting, because we also brought a bunch of the editor functionality into there. So I got coloring and completion and even those Saving automatic fixes, would be awesome, right? Like add using and everything. Uh, yeah. yeah, just all working kind of straight in that little inline in situ experience was was kind of cool. We think that's really great for uh, for kind of building up programs piece at a time where I want to just say, oh here's this little method. I want to just like iterate on this method until I get it right. And then I'll copy and paste it back into my program. Right? It's also great for exploring new APIs. Uh, if I'm looking at 
you know, trying to call string dot format or something like that, and I need to pass one of those format specifiers with the colon D oh. and the <laughs> colon M and dash Somebody negative Somebody really six needs to. And, I don't know what it is. You make that so much easier. Make, I don't make it an enum or, or, or something. something. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's a, it's great to just be able to kind of experiment with that without creating console application 152. Yes, uh, to absolutely. Get there. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, j just talking about some of the innovation, not just for um, uh, examples from the community, but you mentioned the, the vSIP partners. So what are, are some of our partners using Roslyn? Are there folks that have been like, yes, this is perfect. I don't have to worry about compilers as a service. Now I can just focus on building my goodness. Sure. Um, I would say. And yes, I am putting on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> So I'll, I'll pick two examples. One is, is a partner that's inside Microsoft, right? And that's uh, ASP.NET be next. Um, yeah. And so Scott Hunter has a session tomorrow, I think, about, about ASP.NET be next. But they've kind of taken a, a big bet on Roslyn to enable a very lightweight experience for building web applications where I don't have a separate compile step. I, in fact, you know, while I'm working in, de in the development world, I don't even have to write the binaries to disk. We'll just use Roslyn to compile it in memory and run it from in memory so that you know, we can save a bunch of time and, and make things a little bit easier for you. Uh, so that's one example inside where somebody has really leapt on on Roslyn and and, and done how a great exactly job. does that work? So let's say you know I have uh, let's say a controller and all the con uh, controller has is like trace that trace information hello world or, mm -hmm. or or whatever and somebody changes that to I don't know, trace dot warning or, or or adds another trace statement. Yep. How's like, are you having a file system watcher look at that, or how do you even know to? Because you mentioned it doesn't yeah. hit disk. Uh, so so it, it hits disk to read. Uh, okay. So okay. yes, the the ASP.NET be next runtime. Uh, they've put a file system watcher on your whole directory, and they watch for changes. Okay. Uh, but then they pass those files into the the Roslyn compiler, but the Roslyn compiler API just says emit to this stream. Right? And they can back that by a memory stream. And so rather than us writing the assembly that they're going to run out to disk, we can just write it into a memory stream in memory, and then they can assembly.load uh, that, that memory stream. OK, so, so from their perspective, it's like we, you give us some way that we can call in to emit, and then we'll handle the rest in terms of the, the, that memory buffer that yep. you're talking about. Yep. OK, very, very cool. And um, for some of this stuff, how do you uh, understand the context? Is this good? Because it seems like it would almost go back to like, hey, I need to understand all the stuff going on in the page. And if that references, then there's like the call tree of, well, trace is here, which is in this dialog, which also depends on this. And now you need to know all this stuff. Like, does emit just take care of all that for you? Or is there other magic kind of Rosalind magic going on? Uh, no. I mean, basically, in order to, to call the emit method, you have to have set up an object. You have to set, here's all the source files, and here's all the references, and here's the compilation options. OK, so they uh, are telling you you aren't magically. No, no, we're not, <laughs> we're not magically figuring that out. OK, OK. <laughs> now that there is, mag there is magic in Roslyn. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 uh, but yeah, that okay. part they're doing. Um, so going back to, uh, to industry partners, uh, one example of an industry partner that has really uh, kind of gotten behind Roslyn is DevExpress with their Code Rush product. Um, they've been looking at saying, uh, you know, we're really excited about what this can do for, for performance and for memory usage in Visual Studio, because currently we're in this model where if you install Code Rush, they have their whole model of what the world looks like, and right. Visual Studio has its whole model of what the world looks like. And so they've been uh, working really hard on, on getting a version of their tooling that's built on top of Roslyn. Which is actually great, and in some ways you would almost wish more partners would do this, because what will happen is, you know, not to pick on a specific Visa partner, but everybody has to do the full scan on project open, and then you, know, you start typing, you yep. open a specific file, and all that context, rather than pay for it potentially twice, you, can, right. you get everybody sort of b build on a foundation, right? Well, so there's, there's a couple of interesting things. Right now, there's really not a lot of people that do that. Uh, there's kind of two or three partners who do that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the reason why is because it's really hard. You basically have to have implemented a whole compiler yourself. Yeah. Right? Uh, but what we think is really interesting about Roslyn is that it, it democratizes it. Right? It just says, we have this object model here. 
you can go ahead and access it and say, well, for the current document, you know, what's the token that the cursor's at? What overload a, of a method does that resolve to? Mm -hmm. um, and so you can kind of very quickly get at stuff that would have taken you know, a whole lot of effort to, to build the analysis behind in the past. Uh, yeah, so um, you know when you're talking about Roslyn, because uh, I think it's so many opportunities for different things. Now that I have my entire source code and I have it effectively, I can look at things like history or you know just the, the social experiment of performance by person who checked in code over time and sure. all the fun stuff. Are there like other cool uses that you've seen either internal teams like or, or like hackathon style stuff where people were like. Wow, I had no idea that people would <laughs> would go there. Um, I think go, would do the blame game or something <laughs> for for Rosalind. I haven't seen blame game. Um, I think one really interesting thing that came up was uh, was the reference source code base that we have. And so, for people who haven't checked it out, uh, for a long time Microsoft has made the, a reference copy of the .NET Framework base class libraries available. Right. right? And uh, and somebody on our team got kind of frustrated with, with trying to navigate and use that experience. And so what he did is he, he was on uh, paternity leave. And I'm not sure how his wife feels. But, uh, <laughs> but he spent some time while he was on paternity leave. And he built a system that uses Rosalind to load all of those projects. And then it writes out a whole set of HTML where it displays the source files the way they look in Visual Studio with the same colors and all of that stuff. But then every identifier in it is a hyperlink. So if I click on something, I go to definition. And I go to that other thing from the reference source. And if I click on it again, I see all the references, just like I did find references in Visual Studio. Right, right. Um, and so it's kind of a great experience for just browsing source code online. We have an internal one that has all of the source code for Visual Studio. And, uh, and I don't know how I lived without it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I've, I've only seen the, the uh, do you happen to know the URL? Uh, Otherwise, we'll we'll have to tweet it it's, later. It's uh, it's reference source dot microsoft dot com. Okay, uh, perfect. And I think source of dot net also works. Okay, um, you know you, we were talking about uh, some of the different scenarios for Roslyn. What's the you know back to the tens? Like, why would somebody build it? Is it I want to set how my team is going to operate so that way you can't do a check in until you. Well, that, or what are the, some of the, the 10 scenarios, if you will? Uh, so the 10 scenarios are really for our team, right? So they're about us adding and more. And by our team, do you, you mean, mean Microsoft? Or you mean, hey, you're building something for sorry. just your team? By our team, I mean the, the managed languages team, right? Kay. That's the 10s we're talking about. Uh, it's to allow us to add language features faster. So one of the things I talked about this morning was some of the new language features that we're talking about for the next version of, of C Sharp. And in this release, because our, our priority is shipping, again, we're trying to get Rosalind out there, uh, we added some pretty small language features. But it wasn't that hard to add them. And so we're kind of in this model now where we have a great code base where we're set up to, to innovate and, and hopefully do some interesting things in the language coming up. Um, the other set of the tens is kind of the, the IDE tooling experience, right? Some of those things that I mentioned around adding more refactorings. Well, now we have a, a system in place that allows us to do that without modifying the semantics of your code uh, and kind of makes that, that whole process a lot easier. On the my team front, I think a really interesting thing to look at is what we're, we're calling custom diagnostics. And so the idea there is that we provide a hook where you can run some code when we compile. And you can, like I mentioned with the unused usings, you can flag something as a warning or as an error. Uh, and then that shows up when people do command line builds. It shows up when they do continuous integration builds. Mm -hmm. It also shows up live from their sources inside Visual Studio. And so they get a squiggle right away. They can also use this object model to quickly offer uh, a fix so that a little light bulb will show up and say, well, here's how I do this. <laughs> And so that's something that can be applied at the team level. If your team has coding guidelines, uh, in my session this morning, I walked through building a, uh, a diagnostic that would give a warning whenever you have an if statement that doesn't have any braces, for example. Right? So that might be a team policy thing. But another really interesting scenario for these custom diagnostics is they can be part of a NuGet package that comes along with a library. And so you can actually define domain-specific diagnostics saying, hey, I provided this API, and I can recognize that you're not using it right. <laughs> and so here's a warning. So a great example from, from ASP.NET MVC, right? If I'm in a controller and I want to return a view, 
that's a string. That's a file name, right? Right, right. So clearly, the compiler doesn't know anything about what that string is. But I could write a diagnostic that says, hey, that string you gave me, it doesn't match one of the file names in my views directory. So that's an error, because that's right. never going to work at runtime, right? And right. that can ship along with the ASP.NET MVC libraries in NuGet, so I kind of automatically pick that up. And so that, we think that's going to be pretty exciting, that, that library authors can now easily add domain-specific diagnostics for, for their particular areas. Very cool. So uh, I think we are officially out of time. So plugging uh, you on your Twitter yeah. and uh, your sessions. Uh, so Pilchi on Twitter, P-I-L-C-H-I-E. And then sessions. Uh, this morning, I had Future of C Sharp and VB, where we talked about a lot of this stuff. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, async best practices. If you're using async and await, uh, some of the stuff we've learned since we shipped them, some things to avoid, and some things to keep in mind. And then Friday afternoon, uh, C++ scenarios for C-sharp developers. Awesome. All right, well, Kevin, really appreciate your time. And thank you all. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will see you soon. Thanks. Thanks.